Labs project, one of the favorite things that I like, we, we wrote 88 papers together, so uh, just three, four of us studying students in the paper, conferences and journal articles. But just to say, in this uh, fun thing that we had, one of the best things that we had was we never saw which institute we belonged to. We just walked as one. We could talk. Somebody would say, Karakpur, I did not colleagues would, uh, uh, would come and say, hey, uh, you have to talk. Can, can you do this? Can you do this? Dr. CS Kumar would say, can you do this? Uh, do you think uh, this is possible? I said, we'll take, take it or we'll not take it. Mm -hmm. So we did labs that we could take. We couldn't do certain things. But the difficulty here is that this allows you to talk freely. Mm -hmm. But if the one of the pro problems that I see is if most of the laboratory content, if it has to be professional enough, it involves a development cycle. And if it involves a development cycle, having people, funding is better. Funded mechanisms are better. Otherwise, looks, uh, looks are bad. Uh, usage field is not so appropriate because it's all done by you know stitch and cook people. There's no project manager telling look, look, there should be a close button there, there should be a drop down menu there, there's no design yet. You can provide those ideas to the students or the colleagues who are developing it for you, maybe just amateurs doing it. You might not have the workflow processed. So I can see that in uh, Anand's uh, lecture when they're storing everything. We tried doing that for storyboarding our content. Yeah. We wanted to put it on public domain, how, to, how we storyboarded uh, 300 plus experiments in biotechnology. After the work was done, we couldn't find any of the resources. It was in cameras, it was in different formats. We couldn't even get a resource to put it together. That's too much work for one person. So people would say, I'd rather develop a simulator for you, not do that for you. You won't get that. So yes, uh, so there are questions. The worst part in developing, the difficult part in developing a lab with the course is the whether, whether the developed lab will be apt for more than one question. You don't want to invest a lab that answers only one specific style of question. So typically, let's say, if I'm doing a neural circuit lab, a biological neural circuit lab, I would say, I would give set of stimuli and I would say, get a particular, get a particular response. No, but I mean, I mean, I think it's not, I mean, you may have physical labs that look like this. And the labs are there to be respected. So, you know, if you do it virtually, you may not want to mimic exactly those physical things. You may want to do another, because when you are virtually, you can do other things. So you may right on the design dot. it differently. It's right on the dot. It's right on the dot. It's exactly what happens. So, for example, when you even even when you build a remotely controlled equipment, there are certain parameters that you don't want to make it feasible, make it available. On a real world, you you would allow students to do that, you have to do it. But in the virtual world, you would cut down those. You would say, let's ignore those parameters. That's teacher's, let's say, choice. And design piece of content, I'm sorry. That would also be a disadvantage, because uh, when students come to uh, a real laboratory and uh, when dangers happen, and uh, they did encounter them, because they will have thought. Yes. So, that's the problem. But it's also an advantage to be authentic or be close to reality. So in the safety mechanism, that's why I tell you, we want a lab to tell you what, where you can go wrong as well, but not how to go wrong. You don't want to teach a student how to create a poisonous gas. You want to teach them, if a gas happens, what to do with it. So we do ethical systems, we do teach them, but uh, there are limitations. The more parameters that you add into a lab, the more clumsy the lab is, sometimes it doesn't even run on your system. So these are just a few pointers that we gathered over the years, but I'm open to questions. Um, animations somehow appeal to biology and art and philosophy. Simulations appeal a lot more to engineering style students, but not all simulations are attractive. So you need to give them the, even if you build, so there are uh, very simple tools on the internet where you can do simple physical physics experiment. People don't use it. We have taken it to classrooms, we have put it in front of students and said, try this versus that. Tell us what works. And we have to be very careful of choosing. Then there is another thing. We went to a couple of schools, I think CBC schools. We didn't tell them what it is. We just put up a stall. Two of my colleagues were observing it, just recording what was happening. And they said, what is this? Most of the students for half a day didn't turn up. Then the teacher says, you should check out all the stocks. They come out. One student sees it and tries it. And then he starts working on the experiment. Once you see a person working on a remote experiment, his colleagues work on it. We wanted to emulate this on an online environment. We have not been able to. So 
creating that discussion. The reason I asked you when you had 140 quest students in your MOOC course is how did you how did that 140 even stay? So that's a good question. I mean, I know 140 is a good number for a classroom, but it's not good. it is not necessarily a good representation when you do a paper, for example, study or students doing electromagnetic studies. So you may have to dis the learning objectives, course outcomes, and uh, are very different for labs versus classroom courses. At least, at least from the modern curriculum, sorry, current curriculum perspectives, maybe we can modernize it. In most of our courses, since we have done everything, we try to involve both. So we did the, the pre-lab or post-lab, and that's the kind of thing that we're doing. And this is being done by all the partner institutions, whether it's Delhi, Hyderabad, um, Bombay, I, Bombay, or Karakpur, Kanpur, with whoever it is, they are marks, college of engineering, so on. So yes, I'm very interested. Would, it, had there been a chance, we would love to develop, see how, inter, how to integrate. We did a uh, hysteresis loop experiment. That's close to what uh, I could only conceive about, let's say, first year electromagnetism, right? And this experiment was a big success, but not necessarily by students because of their interest, but because of exams. So, if you ask me, each one has a different story to tell. So we may have to work on the story that we need to push through integrating books and virtual apps. Some of the, but the best thing that you know is that for a teacher who spends two and a half hours explaining the protocol, it's 15 to 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you're done. You go out of the classroom and people can go back and practice it and that makes a big difference. And that for us was already a good exercise. We haven't scaled up. So, this year, by March 2020, I'm going to finish 24 new experiments. One is a biosignal lab, one is an R4 bioinformatics lab. Both will be scripting based. We'll see how students use it. I'm very curious to find out when I give realistic labs, what will they do? Like uploading a PDB file and checking what patterns, what pattern rows inside the sequence. What will they do? I'm curious to find out. If there is any other question. <coughs> I am a very curious training student. We have uh, classroom classes. So apart from the classroom classes, that we it can just talk about PPTs, videos, audio and Do you think it's possible to integrate all this in the virtual lab? It, it's already part of the virtual lab. So if you look at videos, it's already part of the virtual lab. If you look at PPT, it's part of the procedure. You will split it and put it in the right context, but that's it. It's only context awareness. So PPT is with a teacher, gives you a context. You remove the context and put it, make it context friendly. So, so, yeah, I mean, for example, there is a, we have UNESCO chair in gender equality and women empowerment, a professor who reads, runs a group called Amachi Labs, Bhavani and some of the mentor in uh, KTH. Bhavani Rao, she is uh, Asia's, she works on gender equality and women empowerment for women's things. So, what she does is skilling, the same thing she teaches plumbing with virtual reality to haptic tools. So she has an entire platform. In fact, we got the Facebook Innovation Award two years ago for the My Sumbum platform that they developed. And they, they, they teach only skilling. So they teach uh, for new literates. So you can see all these nannies and grandmothers and young people starting to do these expensive programs and learning languages in the meantime. There's even in Bihar, one of our students is another Panchayat leader. So she's celebrating and UNESCO celebrates it too. So in many ways, you'll see that putting content together in the right context and actually change the entire problem. I mean, she, in, even in stealing, only 70% can be removed made virtual. So you can, you need to have that 30% real, real stuff from being real. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's no, no excuse for that. But for, but for real laboratories also, I feel the same thing. The only thing is, after 5 o'clock in the evening, when college labs are closed in some institutions, where will the student buy? Maybe virtual labs. That's what I think. And maybe in the future, when you write a textbook, you won't write it just as a textbook. You'll be like a MOOC. You'll be like a there'll be reading part, there'll be laboratory part, there'll be cutting parts. That's where we would target at least uh, topics like electrical machines should go, because otherwise there's no growth and changes in advancing the science at the undergraduate or postgraduate level without the uh, research interest in the student. Any other questions? So yeah, suppose you are taking your students to the real lab. Okay. Uh, what is your mode of operation? And so I feel that before uh, taking them to the real laboratory, mm -hmm. if 
uh, we can develop a system, education system such a way that before they put them into the real world to uh, really improve the skills. If uh, this virtual lab can be made mandatory for all the students as part of their effect, is it possible? We, we ASCD has sent out letters on our request. MHRD has requested all the, they are vice chancellors meeting, they tried doing it. We feel as a democracy we should force something down the throats of people. But at the same time, we tested that module. In fact, in the norms to try content, we don't have to force it. It's just a, I mean, there are six year olds, somebody told about uh, 3D animations at 14 year old. There are six year olds doing all these things that there is a school, there's a robotics lab for children under 10 now. At uh, near our campus, we go to schools, they teach it. So we did this. So, like just what you said, there's a normal classroom course if you want, or no classroom. We have virtual labs and physical labs. Physical labs meaning real labs. And then we did the opposite. We did physical labs and then virtual labs. We found this is a little less effective, not less effective. This is less redundant. This is more redundant than the other one. The other one, surely you see a big spike in learning. You can even validate how much learning has happened. But the other part you can't validate because they've seen the real stuff. They go see a telescope, there's nothing to beat it. Starry skies will not still be equivalent to it. You can see the sky in a beautiful Ready animated manner, but you'll have to be very careful about it. Maybe we, we were trying for astronomy as well, so because it's a one platform where we are looking at now with a new project actually we are trying to look at how certain behaviors are customized in certain labs. It's a VNet, it's called Internet of Us. It's a new project that started in January. We're looking across people in different country how this would vary across different people. So classrooms are kind of different. So if you go to a classroom in Idiki. Not by not Idiki, and you come to a classroom in Toronto, quite totally different, completely different. So we'll we will try that in uh, tribal habitats as well. It's uh, indigenous people in India. We'll be trying that, but it's very different when you see learning patterns. Some of them are really good. Every brain is unique. That I can see. There's no difference. Nobody's different. But the way you motivate them, you have to find your own way. It comes to the point where. How effective is the MOOCs of the input I mean, NP doesn't surely is changing a lot of things that is happening on the side. But there are, there are limitations. And that, that was not designed in NP tunnel. NP was never designed to replace the university. If there is anything more. Yes, please. 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 Because now we are looking at uh, nodal centers developing you no know, content. So there is very little hope of funded new labs being developed by, by people like this. But yes, in the past we opened it up, we had 140 calls. I think they funded 4 or 5 labs. That's it. But the thing is that once you propose an idea, you realize how simple it is to be. It would be because if your lab has to, be, has to fit into your browser, it's not complex uh, computations. It's a much simpler computation. Simpler setup. Uh, at least, I mean, done these labs, I can tell you. If there are no more, thank you so much. Sorry for the
कौन सा कौन सा पोजीशन है नीचे गिरा हुआ है ना हाँ नीचे धक्का हुआ है ऊपर धक्का
Uh, 
and the idea is to build network-based learning communities. And the other type of uh, MOOCs are the X MOOCs. I think these are the most typical MOOCs, uh, which follow basically a traditional course structure with pre-specified pre learning out outcomes, uh, with specified syllabus, and etc. And um, one can say that many MOOCs are in between in the sense that they are combining elements of both models. Basically, in this presentation, I will focus on this kind of CMOOCs, not that XMOOCs are parts of oh, Sorry, I will focus on XMOOCs, not in CMOOCs, not because CMOOCs are, are less important, but again, it's something quite new and we are familiar with that. It's very uncharted uh, models for us, I mean, the economist. Um, so, as I said earlier, for me, and I think for most economists, economists uh, MOOCs are very interesting because they have a certain public good dimension. But, because, uh, but before I embark on a more elaborate discussion on uh, this dimension, I have to define to you to what we economists um, mean uh, when we speak about uh, public goods, and especially pure public goods. So, what is a pure public good in economics? Basically, it's a good or a service which uh, features, shares two common characteristics, two characteristics. The first is uh, a good must be non-rival. What means to be non-rival? Uh, means that uh, the consumption by one or consumer does not prevent consumption by others. For example, uh, if I have a sandwich and I eat it, you cannot eat it. So this food is right. But if uh, I watch a movie in the cinema and watch it with me, so you cannot, you, you do not interfere in my consumption. So watching movies in the cinema is a non right Okay. And the second property of uh, public goods is non-excludability, which means impossible to exclude non-paying consumers. Okay. So, in the previous exam, watching a movie in the cinema, uh, it's not a non-excludable good or service, simply because uh, we have a cinema can exclude non-payers from watching the movie. But on the other hand, if you have, let's say, um, a public beach, a public beach, everybody can go to swim, so it's, in a sense, not a non-excludable uh, good, uh, except if you put fences, then it becomes um, excludable. So, pure public goods in economics share two features. Non, they are non-rival and they are non-excludable. Basically, uh, pure public good in economics is like an exotic bird. There are very few pure public goods in practice. Um, the fresh air, the fresh air, the air we breathe. This is a, public, a pure public good in economics because if I breathe, I don't interfere with you breathing the air. And of course, nobody can exclude someone from breathing. Okay, but there are very few goods who, which share these two uh, properties. Yet, uh, we can speak about goods, about public goods which are close to this idea, and they are called quasi public goods. Quasi public goods. They are closed to public goods. So, after this introduction, uh, one wonders, is higher education a public good? The tradition of higher education as we know. The answer is no. It's not. But it shares some features of a public good, but it's not. Because it is non rival, okay? It is non rival in the sense that the attendance of an education program by an individual does not reduce the attendance possibilities of the others. Which means if we have another person in this uh, class does not interfere with uh, your attending, so in the sense, in this sense, it's a non-rival. But the excludability is more complex. Okay, it's more complex, and it depends on the organization and the institutional factors of each educational system. But in general, a university can exclude people uh, by attending uh, their class simply by exams, by tuition fees, etc. So it's not about the traditional higher education, as we know at the traditional university. But 
MOOCs, in a sense, they are very close to public goods because they lose the constraint of excludability. Uh, especially MOOCs in their very, very first mock form as they were presented in the world in 2012, where the first MOOCs were introduced, I think, by Stanford and MIT, and my, and my were something which was basically was a, were pure public goods, okay? Uh, because they are very open to everyone, uh, they are non-rival, non-excludable, and um, this was very fascinating from a point of view of an economist, okay? Because we have we had a new group uh, which uh, was approaching the, the nature of a public good or a quasi-public good. So, the interest, one interesting thing regarding public goods, um, regarding MOOCs, is that their they're public good dimension. So, one may wonder now, and why is it so important to have public, to produce public goods in our society? Well, there are two good reasons to have public goods in a society. The first is that they generate wider social benefits. This is what economists call as positive externalities. The positive externalities of education are well known. For example, in a recent paper I wrote uh, with other colleagues, we found that uh, the possibility uh, of suffering uh, from diabetes is a chronic illness, is uh, highly associated with your education, even after, uh, even after controlling um, for income. Which means that if you educate people, they get less uh, unhealthy, uh, they have uh, less possibility to get uh, in an unhealthy situation to suffer from chronic illness, which means lower costs for the public health system. And this is a wider benefit. And one can think of many such wider benefits. So this is the first reason we want to have uh, the first reason the first reason why public goods are socially desired. The, the second is that they reduce socioeconomic inequalities simply because they are equally available to everyone. Are there any disadvantages? Yes, they are. Because public goods, they tend to be produced at suboptimal quantity. And the reason is obvious. It has to do with economic incentives. So, exactly for this reason, a question of finances, financing emerges. And it's crucial. So, the question becomes how to generate income, how to generate income, uh, how to generate income from for uh, uh, financing the cost of MOOCs without losing the public good dimensions, the public good dimension of it. Uh, someone uh, may have um, many, many ideas. Um, basically, I will focus on two dimensions. The first dimension is the for profit or not for profit, which is more um, uh, more suitable uh, uh, to generate income. Again, there are pros and cons. Again, because for profit institutions attract funding more easily. Okay, it's more easy to attract uh, funding from capital markets. But on the other hand, then to increase to increase excludability. So they somehow reduce the public good dimension which, as we said earlier, is something beneficial for society. And then not for profit, institutions depend on donations, public resources, resources, and they promote openness. Uh, yet, uh, it's not so easy for them to generate income. Um, another uh, another um, uh, advantage of not for profit uh, institutions is that, in general, they are associated with better education quality as the professor uh, very rightly said in the morning. Um, um, so, in sum, in any case, MOOCs have to generate income in order to cover their cost, their cost at least. Okay? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just saying. In the previous slide you said, uh, not this one, but one before this, you said um, in suboptimal quality quantity, right? Is that in terms of the end, end outcomes, or is it the MOOC itself? Uh, it it will be this in terms of the socially desirable. It means that we want more of that good, but it cannot produce because the people 
uh, who produced it, this food don't have the incentive to produce as much as the society ideally uh, would want. So, so this is the, the, the next question, which is how to generate income in a sustainable way for most. I have, um, I have here listed uh, five models, uh, five models which appear to have prevailed uh, in the market, and all of them have pros and cons. The first is the certification model. It's models to generate income. Okay, or no. The first model is a certification model, according to which students attend for free, but they have to pay to get the certification. As I, as I understand, uh, this is the model that Swayam follows, if I am right. Huh? It's free, but you have to pay for a certification. And then there is the freemium model, according to which a basic service is offered for free, but the user uh, have to pay for extended services, which might be a face-to-face -face interaction or whatever. Uh, there is the advertising model, which again services are offered for free of, charge, free of charge, but the uh, information is, and space is paid for the uh, advertisers. Um, as you see, all this model um, have a public good dimension. Something is offered for free to people. Okay, but at the same time, they try to find resources to cover costs. Okay, and there's also the job matching model, which is something uh, not well developed, but promising, which are platform, platforms uh, which offer job matching services, both to employers and prospective employees. And finally, the subcontractor model, of, uh, where uh, MOOCs uh, are acting as subcontractors, private fields and or uh, universities. Now, uh, each of these models have pros and cons, so there is, a not, there is not a one uh, solution to fit to everything. Uh, let's start with the certification model, according to which the basic, the basic advantage is that job markets value the signal that is conveyed in the certificate. Okay. Um, but, on the other hand, there is a minus, which is that reliable signals only come from highly reputable uh, institutions. Okay. So a platform may, um, may want to uh, uh, provide certificates and price them, uh, but at the same time might not have the reputation to be accepted by the market. We have the freemium model, which is a model according to which a basic service is provided free to all, and then extended services are, uh, have to be paid. Uh, it's a good model. It works, it works. It's very prevalent in the, in the internet as well. Everybody who has knows many platforms offer free services, but then they ask you uh, something more uh, for extended services. And the obvious disadvantage is the decrease of benefits because uh, you subtract uh, precious services um, from the clients, from the users. There's the advertising models. It also works in the internet. And it's very prevalent. Let's say YouTube. YouTube follows this model partly, as we well know. But it might not be compatible with education because, in general, it might annoy students and universities who don't like the commercialization of education. There's the job matching model again, which is very promising, I think, especially the use of big data. Uh, there are some new platforms, some new. Um, applications which try to use data so as to match employers and employees. Something like the Tinder who makes people, but uh, imagine something different, uh, an application who match employees and employers. It, on the other hand, it's difficult to implement and it's out of the core of the goal of, uh, of, the, core of the, the core goal of MOOCs. And finally, the subcontracting model. Uh, which has uh, met several advantages. One of them it helps, may help private firms and universities to reduce costs. But uh, on the other hand, uh, this kind of models, um, this kind of business models, um, are black with uh, several issues such as lack of trust, especially uh, in the higher education sec section. Is uh, there is a lack of trust between private actors and universities, as we already know. 
Well, the concept of the university is the most famous university. They promote this type of interaction with the students, especially of ideas. Uh, and the uh, universities tend to be quite uh, liberal in the society outside, where uh, ideas can be exchanged. In some universities, uh, you have classes for free speech and things like that, that can you know, exchange all kinds of ideas. Uh, most of the many universities are not that. So I don't think that those will ever be. I can add on a point as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Most of the time, even if I had to choose a course, online books, I, if, if the topic is machine learning, I would like to uh, take the topic, I mean, the course from uh, maybe Andrea, who is one of the you know, top professors who has done a lot of research in a particular university. So the university, if the research is part is also very important there. You know, the, Credibility of that the teacher and all the reputation. This university really provides that. Otherwise, it is a bad content, however good it is. But then uh, there is always a question mark on some other facts which are provided. Going back to the so you said about uh, the degrees and standards. So the question is, in future, wouldn't wouldn't we only have a few winners of that sort? So let's say courses from Stanford alone will be will prevail in the what I want to meant is that the university provides that research ecosystem and innovation to students, professors, and all. so it, I feel that it may not, MOOCs can, may not replace universities immediate future. Not immediate future, what I feel is that uh, students may want to come to the traditional universities for all these things that uh, Professor was saying, for all the external, but for a course, they can as well finish it off the MOOC. But Probably. in all other things. Uh, I, so I ask students I, how they use MOOCs, and I have observed when they ask them. So usually they come in the classroom uh, because uh, you know, we teachers come in the different styles and all. And some students like the style, some students don't like the style. So, the group, we cannot have it with them. They will go to the and it's very good because they have other things, uh, to, uh, other tools. So, they, so, so, so moves are a help for them. So it's a game, yes. yes. No, not, I, I see it more as a compliment, as a, as a help for us. Uh, that's what and the motivation that you get in going to a university and that is something that you miss out totally in books. It can be used as a substitute for you know small points of learning, small courses, additional information. But for the main courses I think we'll go back because they trust the people who yeah, are teaching. Yeah, it's about trust. Yeah, That's it. The reputation is about yeah. trust. Yeah, yeah. 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 one aspect that works up specifically in this issue the risk for universities in the long run. I, I think it's in the long run the attitude of the employers, of the companies, or whatever stakeholders that employ people is the crucial factor. Because today is still, I think, uh, having attended a program and getting a degree still has some impact. But if it doesn't yeah. do that in the future, so for example, I mean, if I understood, for example, LinkedIn as a tool, I use more and more of my companies for HR. Yes, services. So if you get a, like a cartel of actors like LinkedIn with actors like Coursera, so a few of these put together, work tightly together, and you, the employers put into the practice that they can go into this site and then they they may, it may happen, but I mean, I, I think it would take time, but I'm, I'm not so afraid, but I, I think that's a potential yeah. issue that can happen, and that can weaken the importance of having a degree, because then it could be that what the student has is a portfolio of courses, uh, and that has a status in that system of actors, and the employer look at that rather than but yes, that is yes, yes, yes. But, but we are 
don't dare. I'm going to say it. That's important. So there's one thing in Nietzsche that we talk about is we hire for attitude. Can I just say? We hire for attitude. Because what's happening in the present industry is we are all so good working in solos. But you attribute it to a group activity and they just can't adjust. Adjustment has become a factor which is no longer there in any company. And that is the reason why most of the companies are stuck at a particular level. It is only when it comes to those who are scientists or a group of scientists because they are selfless. That is why we have so many inventions coming out, but we are not able to translate that to an industry. So the major problem today in a company is this. And to train them, you know, to change their attitude and get into a company, it takes about two to three years. And that costs the corporate a lot of money. So this is a major impact that we are coming to. So with that, uh, a traditional university like this will play a very major role. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I just have uh, yes, yes. So I have been uh, one of the beneficiary of MOOCs okay, to say that when uh, Liverpool John Moose University runs its entire master's program of artificial intelligence on MOOCs. There is no physical contact of any You are writing a master's thesis and you are learning the biggest of the, the greatest of the algorithms like GAN, CNN, everything, everything of the content management. It's not a premium model or anything, it's a paid model. Yeah, there, is, paid, yeah. Yeah, paid model. there is exclu excludability of to a great extent because you have to qualify yourself to get over there, so it's not open for all. However, the, as uh, the mayor was saying, there is disadvantages of no physical contact, your attitude of the students doesn't, what is it, doesn't get shaped in according to what corporate requires. But there is other way which this can be supplemented on. So one of the greatest things, examples of NJMU is that when they have got something called a student resources, the resources doesn't just stop with IEEE resources, but it goes to psychological counselling also. So if I am kind of an introvert, there is a psychological counselling which is given to me which says that, one, okay, please see how you can gel well within the group, everything on online. So these are certain things, some what say, changes which we make, then MOOC can be a really good course and model. Why I say it is a MOOC, it should, it should not replace uh, the traditional university, I am for it. But the areas where education is very difficult to reach, I think at that place MOOC plays a very excellent, it plays a very good role over there. I think the board should be a combination of MOOC plus the traditional university exactly. going to it. Exactly. That, that, that's exactly. my point. Yeah, that's my point. And I close this, uh, this presentation by saying to you that in uh, economics of education, there are basically there are two theories explaining why someone goes to the university. The first is the human capital theory, which says that we go to university to acquire skills. And the second is the job signaling theory, uh, which says that we go to the university and get a degree to send a signal in the market that we are capable. The first thing, acquiring skills, is done very, I think, very effectively by, by the most, but they are weak the second, in sending strong signals to the market. And it has to do with their reputation and their distrust. So my opinion is that uh, still universities have a very great role uh, in playing exactly in that. And maybe as very, very uh, well said, uh, very well said, um, the combination the combination of these two worlds might be a very good idea, especially for reducing uh, special inequalities, geographical inequalities, a very good idea. Uh, okay, thank you very much, and I'm happy that I could get uh, a lively discussion. Thank you. The last session is a wrap up session. Okay.
we should have a very long wrap up here. Uh, the next step uh, for the Mides project actually is, is now uh, actually to decide a form of about a small set of uh, promising and that's what can be important extensions. Uh, things that we don't feel is entirely solved or things that seems uh, um, also important. So I, I listed here a, a few things, I can I have to go through them. Uh, also then after that, uh, I'm, I welcome uh, your opinions and whether you think things are, are uh, wrong or more you want to add something. And, and we also will send, circulate after, after these to all of you, so you have a possibility uh, also to have, have comments later because we try, I, I think for a number of weeks now, we will try to collect opinions on what are uh, potentially good continuations here or our ending activities uh, before we decide. Uh, but we, we need to decide pretty soon, I assume, in this project, what we do in the last months. Uh, so, one thing that, and these are, are maybe they are not very well sorted, but are things that have come up during the last days. Uh, so, so one thing that has been mentioned several times is, is the assessment. And especially if we assume uh, that we will have pretty large courses of you know, uh, this kind. I don't know what you said, what is massive, but let's say we talk about thousands at least. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, autogradable assessment is probably a necessity. So it would be nice to make some experiments how to be able to move from uh, multiple choice uh, to some robust version of this open text uh, input that works better than, than many times today. Uh, also the drag and drop function, but as I got a little inspired by the talk here about animation, uh, I could think about even a little more flexible and versions of configuration uh, tools, and possibly also when you have animation, it could be very nice to formulate assignments. So, so that I could see as an interesting type of study. Of course, in my mind, one have to do these studies in a, in a pilot way, so one have to have some experiment course and, and, and do the studies, have to some specific course, it's very difficult. Uh, also, something I discussed with we uh, discussed yesterday. It may also be interesting to look, have some exercises, in learning learning outcomes, because obviously there are two traditions. We still have syllabus around. Uh, that's a fact, even though people want to have only learning outcomes. So as long as we have that, it's it kind of important to understand the relation with syllabus and learning outcomes. So to do some systematic exercise for a well-defined course. Uh, some course that everybody knows. I know, and it depends on what everybody knows, but if you are an engineer, basic math course like linear algebra is kind of well known. So, so you do the exercise for a realm that is pretty well defined at least in the group uh, that is passing. Um, also, I think this thing that has come up, uh, how to include other material, uh, I mean, of, of different kinds, in a systematic way. Um, because there I feel maybe some of these things may be wrong, because MPTEL, for example, as a system, may support things, but some of us have not understood it. So that's a disclaimer for everything. But at least on my level, I, I don't have full clue whether there are some systematic guidelines to the authors and developers with respect to handling these additional materials. Um, so that's the third idea. And also, I, I, I don't know if you touched it today, but the systematic approach to third party excellent video clips uh, it would also be interesting to take up because um, there are so many fantastically good small clips that can explain small specific phenomena. But I feel, also because I feel myself, that sometimes one is conservative in including other people's things. I think we should be more bold in including references 
to other peoples. Why, why do an uh, explanation of something that somebody yeah, explained it better earlier? And I think that's part of being an academic. Mm. Yeah, but it's, it's, I don't think it's so common in the productions of online, uh, actually. And, and we should do it in more and in a more systematic way. So that could also be interesting to look into. Uh, also, this alignment between assessments and learning outcomes, which we heard, I heard there was a colleague yesterday who commented that. I mean, we, we can write nice learning outcomes, but they are just archival and nobody looks at them. So to, to really see it, try to look into how our assessment are truly mapped on the learning outcomes would also be probably a step forward here. Also I think on a smaller plane, this item analysis, I, I think, <laughs> I think very, very important from, from a micro perspective. If you have made a course, uh, uh, how you can fine tune your, your assessments by, by some analytic studies of, of, of the role uh, of your assessment items, especially so that uh, your assessments are fair on the relevant levels uh, uh, of, of grading, and uh, seems very important, I think, from a student uh, perspective. Uh, also, I, I think we, we still, um, the lab issue, it is an important one, whether, whether one can use that through virtual labs or some other, but still we want labs in our courses, uh, one way uh, or the other. So I think that needs further investigation uh, at, this, uh, at this point. Um, also, um, the, the, the simple access to programming framework. So as, as, a, as, a, as a course constructor, you can with ease um, choose to include uh, a programming platform easily in your course and then systematically use it. And MBTL claim that this is fully possible and, and they may be right. Still, I think it's not only what's technically possible that's important, it's also uh, how easy a potential developer feels do this systematically in your course. And, and uh, maybe my knowledge is uh, not full here, but I would uh, like to look into that more. Um, also, real life demos, but maybe that's not a very crucial. You could probably do that easier as it is. Then we have this credit transfer issue that we had for a long time on the agenda. I think it's still not solved. We have to look more into it. Um, the final thing. I am written here, but I also have come up lately is what I mentioned this morning that we, we have this uh, communication among uh, universities and specifically for India, the outreach uh, to, uh, to the outer regions, what I don't know you call what tire, the different uh, levels uh, of smaller villages and, and, and cities and also looking into the situations of smaller colleges. And as we happen to have smaller colleges before, mm -hmm. uh, that is a pity if we haven't utilized the possibility to go further there. So that I would also include. But feel free to say some of these ideas were really stupid or that we want to add something. And I now, I'm, I'm happy to get it now, or we will see to that we you get the link so you can add ideas later. So, any comments? Yes. Did I do you capture both points? Wait. There's a portal called Upgrad. Sorry? There's a portal called Upgrad. Upgrad is an LMS company, learning management yes. system company. They have implemented this, the systematic facilitation of programming exercise. So, okay. basically, what they have done is they have built a console for learning Java, R, and Python. So there is, what is it, a console where there is a problem which is given, you have to write a code for that one. So and there is an input, the way you write the code, then there is an output which says that one whether you got the resultant output, whether what was the, uh, what, how could you have creatively written the code in a better way, and that output will you if you are judged upon that. It's okay. well built in the elements. Right. So, 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 so then, maybe, then, then it's maybe solved then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's done, it's done very well. Okay. okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'll show you. Okay, second. Let's go.
Any other ideas, comments? Um, there's a, I still remember that we were talking about this a couple of months ago, maybe we were even within courses, what kind of granularity are you looking for the last one? The adjustment of credit transfers and stuff? Because no, you know I, the mechanism. Yeah, I think okay, you can obviously mean anything, but, but what, what I refer to here is that you're taking an MPTEL course, you have a certificate, uh, and that you, when you apply for something, you, you, you will either want uh, in your CV for an application for being tested, judge, or uh, to get a credit transfer, you can get credits for uh, corresponding uh, to that MPTEL course. Now, MPTEL also actually started what Coursera done for a long time, introduced to many specializations, uh, uh, which is block uh, which, which is blocks of, of courses within the same area. Something along the lines you said in, in artificial intelligence. So I think it was explicitly mentioned that there is a uh, kind of main specialization in artificial intelligence. Yeah, it is. So, so uh, and, and of course, there, that one also can look into if it's more natural to, to get credits for that because it's more well established. But that could be part of the same yeah. thing. In fact, uh, uh, one of the highlights of this uh, upgraded in JMU, what is it, this online master's course in data analytics is like, uh, the, like for example, post this course, people attend interviews. So they are asked a live problem, problem, problem on uh, Python programming or an R programming. So they have a learning model where you can practice your programming skills and you get certifications out of that. And you, it's like a gaming. So it's it's a game and like as you said, it's a gold delight and what is it, the past levels. The way you have coded yourself, you get a certification level. And that employer can see that and he doesn't have to give you any online courses on programming. It's all embedded over there. So it happens as a game and you also get a certificate inside that. And before interviewing, the employer can see all these credentials of you and he can just move on. He, he doesn't have to waste time on you. Once again, it's all move into the same fashion as for architects, where you have a couple of your portfolio of uh, yeah. uh, what you have created or uh, written somehow. Okay, <coughs> any other comment? Um, okay, if not, you have an opportunity later in the secret that you have. So by this, I, I just want to thank you again uh, to, uh, to our, our hosts. Uh, thank you for your hospitality. We are glad to be here. Uh, I, I hope you will have a uh, as a real Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much.
meeting the requirements of the industries after four years. So we need to keep all those things in our mind. And so we need to make sure that we also, other than more of teaching, we should stop teaching and we should start learning more. And when we start learning more, we can do better to our student community. So I wish uh, we will continue this network, uh, this relation to what we are with, and we'll be able to you know, share our practices, do things. So there are uh, people from across the globe who can support us whenever we need certain inputs from them. And uh, I wish you all, all the best. Happy Independence Day in advance. And have a safe journey. Thank you.